Athletes and their mental health. This will be the topic of discussion on episode number four of Sports Table Talk, hosted by Wetson. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Sports Table Talk. I'm your host, Wetson. Thank you for joining me. And thank you for joining the podcast. And also, uh, like, subscribe, comment, let me know what you think. And, you know, just if you want to be a guest, you can always, you know, hit me up and then we'll go from there. Um, now, joining me today, we have two people. And they're actually back on the show. Um, we have Saul. How you doing? And we have Taco. What up? What up? All right. As you can see, he's starting off wrong already with that hat on his head. But we're not going to, you know, we're going to ignore that. <laughs> um, <laughs> on today's episode, we're actually talking about Naomi Osaka. We're talking about, you know, I'm sure you guys have heard or know what's going on with her in the last week. And, and that led to her, you know, um, pulling out of the French Open. And now, I guess, you know, now, you know, we'll talk about it a little bit, you know, discuss it and see, um, is there something, you know, we should do or that we should do things a little bit differently? And my question for you guys is, do you think athletes should have the option to opt out of doing press in order to maintain, you know, this, whatever zone they're in or for their mental health? Like, do you think they should have the option to opt out of there without the penalty? Or if they're willing to accept the penalty... Just leave it at that. Do you guys think, you know, uh, they should have that option? Saul, let's start with you. Um, first things first. I'd say that athletes already have that option because regardless if you're fine or not, some I guess at that point you just have to I guess, prioritize what's most important to you. So options always exist to them in regards to doing a press or not from Kyrie, who's been doing it all year, even beforehand, to a whole bunch of other athletes elsewhere who have actually been, I guess, in conflict with the press and don't want, really want it to do as much as they're required to do or, being, or actually being asked to do. That said, they always had the option to, to not do it and accept the, accept the fine. Now, the question of whether or not they should be fine and so doing is a whole other question and separately because it involves, I guess, partly their contracts, um, what they agreed to do, what, what they're expected to do as a result of who they are, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like, I think a part of it as well is just celebrity culture. So like people around the world have gone used to the idea of having always having access to celebrities to their opinion, to their ideas, to their thoughts, to their face, just always having access to these people because of how we put them in society, how high we put them in society. So I think in order to change it, you'd also have to change the very culture that demands such access to these celebrities and their time and all these other things. Partly, all again, I think in addition to that, you would also have to ask, I guess, we also have to come to a face to face with the fact that times change, people change and cultures change. And it seems to me like as we relate, it seems like the athletes of today are not like the athletes of yesterday's who athletes of yesterday's were more accommodating to the press and stuff of that nature, as opposed to the athletes today who feel as if there's a whole lot of other things they want to got, they have going on in terms of how they, they're thinking, how they're feeling. I think there's a lot of emphasis being put on mental health these days as well, as well as a lot of emphasis being put on everybody's individual, I guess, ideas of how they see themselves and how they want to, represent themselves without having to, I guess, endure the criticism that everybody else wants to put on them for doing what they feel like doing. So I think it's, it's a very multi-layered conversation, but I think ultimately the choice always exists for everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay. Taco, before I let you go, um, I was going to say, but you know, I think what they were doing was they were trying to like, change the rules in order to make sure that athletes don't have the option to take those, day those days off. Mm. So, but go ahead, Steve. What I was gonna say is, is it's such a tricky situation because, uh, like Saul was saying, a lot of these times it's built into their contract, and with the TV rights and all, all the different deals that are negotiated all the way down, you know what these athletes have to say after these major events and these major you know games become you know words that people hang on and sound bites that they can use forever. And clips that they use to document the, these occasions. So, I I I'm kind of like 
50 50 though because i understand the mental health aspect of it and what some of these players are dealing with and i I do feel like it's a little different when you have a team sport versus an individual sport because in a team sport you know like with the nets you still have kd you still have Kyrie, you still have harden so maybe if harden doesn't doesn't talk you still have KD, you still have Kyrie, you have some guys there to at least give some feedback so it's not quite as, you know, important or imperative. It's like, okay, let's find out what this guy had to say yesterday, you know, tomorrow or the day after. Um, whereas when you're, you're Osaka, she's a one-man band. Like, she's the only one there. And for her to consistently, you know, be a top player and have to deal with the pressures that she goes through, I think that's going to wear a lot more on someone like her than it would be to say a Kyrie, not to say Kyrie doesn't have his own difficulties, but I have less, less ability to be like, well, Kyrie shouldn't have to do interviews versus a Naomi Osaka, who's, you know, documented saying that she has depression and she's going through mental things and she, it does feel uncomfortable. She does experience anxiety and for things like that. And and for a person like that, it's hard for me to be like, well, yeah, you better go do your press because it's like, well, that's not a good situation for her in their mental health. But a guy like Kyrie, who's, you know, doing it just because he doesn't want to do it and wants to be a showboat, that's a different situation and makes me feel differently. So I, I'm, I'm like 50-50 on it. I almost feel like it could be um like Marshawn Lynch. Like Marshawn Lynch is like literally goes there. I'm just here so I won't get fined and keep it moving. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, if you want to be like that, be like that. But I think Marshawn Lynch has the best. He says, I don't want to be here. I don't want to do it. So you know what? I'm just here so I won't be fined. And if you want to change the rules, then change the rules. And, and if you want to lax it up for me or, or or make it where 50% of the team has to talk, so this way everyone doesn't have to talk, but you can't have those team spokesmen, which now makes sense, then you can have some of those veterans at the end of the bench where, guess what, maybe the thing they do is they after the press conference talks. But I do think that maybe an evolution in how, in how the, 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 the players and the press interact is something that may be needed. Okay. No, I mean, that makes sense. And, you know, you both oh, have made very valuable And one, one, one last point I want to add to that. Mm-hmm. Another reason why, too, is some of these sports writers are literally out for these clickbait headlines, mm-hmm. and they're trying to rope these players and these athletes into these uh, stupid questions and trying to elicit these, these harsh responses. Like, even with the mm-hmm. R.J. Barrett, like that guy that was asking him, so how, so was the season a failure if you guys lose tonight? He's like, who's even thinking about losing tonight? I'm facing an elimination game, and you're asking this irrelevant question just to get an emotional response out of me. Like, those kind of, of, of journalists need to also be checked out because you know what? You can't be doing that kind of stuff. It's a professional environment. Ask professional questions that relate to that criteria. And if you can't do that, then you need to step off and someone needs to be checking them because all they're trying to do is uh, get all these players riled up. I think it goes back to what I was saying about celebrity culture. They, they literally want access to them all the time. So yeah. if you have access to somebody all the time, of course, at some point, they're going to say something you don't agree with or something you could manipulate or maneuver to, yep. to fit whatever narrative you want because you always have stuff. They always have to say stuff to you. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's not like, like you just said, like they're not most of the time professional questions. They're clickbait questions, provocative <laughs> questions in order to elicit a certain kind of response so that we can have memes for years to come. Yep. Yep. And that's one of the things that, you know, that I was thinking about because, well, for one, okay, here are my thoughts. I think the whole, you know, pre-game, post-game press thing, I think it's an antiquated process or antiquated system that they need to modify or that needs to go away as a whole. Because once upon a time, and you were saying how, you know, um, how, you know, the, the athletes should, you know, should be able to, you know, take the time and all that. And, you know, nobody's telling them not to. Well, Stephen A disagrees, but, you know, that's that's another thing. But um, because in one hand, it's like, oh, yeah, how you know, I agree, mental health, yes. But at the same time, you need to do this. So it's like, okay, you're talking out of both sides of your mouth. But, mm-hmm. Um, I understand that. because, you know, that's his job. But I think it's definitely antiquated. And I think, you know, when they're saying, oh, yeah, you know, one, you know and one thing that they were, he was saying was like, oh, yeah, and now it's a part of your contract. It's also part of your branding. It's also part of like, you know, you know, the reporters do stories on you in order for, you know, to put, you know, to let your st- story be told, you know, to be more out there. But the thing with that is like, the reason I say it's antiquated is because that's no longer the case. Once upon a time in 1950, when in order to hear what Will Chamberlain said after a game was he had to, you know, after the game was played, he speaks to a reporter. And then now the reporter now relays this, whether it's in the newspaper or on TV, that's how you're able to see it. Now, 
there's more asset, more access than ever. These guys could jump right on there, you know, on you know, on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter, and at all time they have come direct access to their fans at all time. Mm -hmm. the, they could they completely like the media as as a middleman could be completely eliminated. But then the most part. question. Then do you mandate them to have to go live on their own platforms? Because then you put it if you put it into a situation where you tell the player, like, mm -hmm. yes, you have all this access, but most of these times these players don't want to smoke after the game or a bad no, no, game. No. And that level of accountability post game is what we've come to expect. Like when when a guy loses in the finals and he has to come answer those questions. Yeah, that that's tough. Yeah, that's rough. But you know what? That is part of the game, and it's always been part of the game. But you know what? You know what? Always part of the game doesn't necessarily mean it's you know like it needs to continue because guess be what? Part of the game. Because guess what? There's plenty of things you know like you know that that was part of the game before that we don't do now. They change rules. They change you know things change all the time. That's how we. That's how it's always been. Customs. You know, you know even the way the press do things is different. And usually, and my thing is like especially with the post, you know, like see, like like, like Zach was saying, it's like. The press, like you know, like uh, the questions that they're asking after these games, is like, "Oh, how'd you get out rebounded today by the other team?" It's like, they and I remember, you know, dude, uh, dude from Baylor after you know um, a couple of years ago, when you know when he, when he was when he was asking a sim, sim, stupid question, he goes, "Oh, just so you know, um, when the ball goes up, somebody miss, and I bring it down, hold it with two hands, and come down with it. That's a rebound. They got more of those than we did. That's how we got out rebounded." And it sounded like it sounded silly at the time, but it's like that's a stupid question. And like you've seen it time and time again when these guys ask questions, like for till till this day, whenever you see that, that Westbrook face, you know, that meme where they ask something, he's like, bro, what are you talking about? It's like you could tell because a lot of times they're not even asking anything really relevant. Did you feel the pain in your broken ankle after you broke it? What? <laughs> like <laughs> what I noticed mean? you wore a head a red headband today as opposed to a white one. Was that a fashion choice? Like a lot of times, and then you're talking like these players finish playing, you know, or this, and they're anticipating, you know, they're facing elimination, like RJ Barrett was saying, right? Or, you know, they, they just finished losing in a tough game. They exhausted, they've been playing for however long. And now you sit, they have to sit down here and listen to you ask stupid questions about, you know, every single play that happened in the game. It's like, if you are not going to, like, you know, completely do away with the system, you need to change it. You need to change the way it's done. Because it is antiquated, and again, I think it's, it, it takes out the. It takes, and I can see why it has an effect on the players and on their mental health because they have other things that goes on outside of the game, and then they come to the game, and now you talk about oh, before the game, let's talk, let's ask you all these stupid questions. After the game, let's ask you some more stupid questions. It's like a lot of times, it's like. Yeah, but that, that's part of the responsibility when you're an athlete, though, is to have some sort of accountability to the fans. And that's mainly done through the media because often, while we can... Okay, I, sorry, sorry. I, think, I think for me, I think for me, I'm, I'm going to say this is my last one about this, is, is, is the fact that I think there needs to be a middle ground. Because like I was saying, just because something has been going on or should traditionally be going on doesn't mean it should continue to go on. We learn new information gets gathered, new ideas gets gathered, we process it, and we move forward from then on. For like example, from this situation, example, she's a lot of athletes are going are, are saying the same thing and of late. You know what I'm saying? If they're everybody's constantly kind of in different sports, whether it's team sports, individual sports, a lot of athletes, especially the high athletes, because they're the ones who most get the most uh, you know attention. The athletes yeah. who, who who are the best at what they do. So especially them, they've been getting a lot, we've been saying a lot about in terms of like how they're feeling in terms of this. So it definitely needs some reflection and some middle ground because I at the same time we do want like the media because they do give us perspective and they do give us uh, ideas in terms of like what's going on with the players and what's happening, sometimes even behind the scene, stuff like that. All those things are very nice to have access to. However, having constant access to the players. It definitely wears on them way too much to always and constantly. I think it's a middle ground in which you can still get what we need from them mm -hmm. while simultaneously guaranteeing them the space that they need to actually be individual human beings. Sorry to interrupt. Just wanted to remind you, if you haven't done so already, to please subscribe to this channel and also hit the bell notification so you can be notified of future episodes. Also, make sure you like this video, comment your thoughts below, and share this video with your friends and family. Thank you so much. Now back to the episode. I definitely agree with that. Yeah, and, and I think that that's like the, the perfect 
the perfect point because I do agree some of the stuff that you know they're doing now is a bit antiquated and we can update it for the technologies that we have and the capabilities that we have maybe it's like hey if you don't do the press conference tonight you know you have to do a live on your thing where you reach out to your fans and discuss the game or something in a space that you feel more comfortable to compensate for those duties I definitely agree but the other thing is like if you just leave it up to them where, you know, you're only going to talk to the fans whenever you want through your mediums, then we're never going to get the kind of interaction that's needed in order to create some of the emotional storylines that are needed in order for sports to be sports. Like, you know, knowing about this guy's situation and knowing about this report, like, you know, those are things that throughout history, you know, you go to the paper, you read about this player struggles and that, and that, this, that gets us closer to the players that gets them, you know, essentially, like you said, their brand, now some of these players are doing it on their own mediums, but at, at the end of the day, can you trust how many of them to do it? How many of them are going to take those responsibilities? And when you do give it to the opportunity of the press, they are able to get, you know, I'm not saying all the press are good, but some ask some really good questions and get some really, you know, vital information for us fans as, you know, especially like when you're in football and, and you're trying to figure out what your team's doing and like in the off season and, and when you, your players are going through struggles and stuff like that. Some of that information is nice for fans to know, and it, if fans want that kind of access, and I do think that finding the middle ground is going to be um, what this generation's you know group of athletes is going to have the biggest struggle with, because they're very vocal about it. You know, Kyrie's now coming out, uh, Naomi's coming out. Something's going to change eventually, but how yeah. and what that that's going to be huge. But um, all right. Hmm? All right, so yeah, no. Um, now that you guys mentioned Kyrie, right? We still don't know much about like what was going on with Kyrie or why he took those time off. It could have been similar to, to to Naomi, but because he wasn't like as vocal about it or he didn't put it out that like the same way. It's like now we just assume that Kyrie was, you know, um, the amount of things we heard about Kyrie, like just go back and, and look at first take for when he took those games off. Mm-hmm. Stephen A went on his usual rant, but like was absurd, and then everybody talking about you know, oh, you know about obligations to the game, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. nobody talk about, you know, like games or at least, you know, like, you know, the media or the obligation to the players in terms of, you know, uh, treating them like they're human. Because let's face it, the media treating, you know, like these athletes, like they're robots. You take a guy like LeBron James, for example, there's nothing he could do without it being scrutinized and talked about for, you know, for hours on end. There's 10 shows on ESPN alone from morning to, to, uh, to, to night about, you know, every single aspect of the game. So when you take that, if you guys, you know, when, you know, were in like certain positions or you guys were, you know, you guys were in position or you could talk to the powers that be, how would you change that? How would you, you know, like find that middle ground that we're talking about? Go ahead, bro. Um, well, I mean, if, if I'm looking at it, I think it just maybe needs to be more, more middle ground where maybe you have more players that are going to be involved in the media who are asking some of these questions and, and former athletes who are in those positions that, uh, you know, uh, of being in the game, missing the shots and, and watching teams out rebound you where they can actually come with insightful questions based on the game and saying, Hey guys, you know, you guys normally play like this and they got you out of your rhythm. What did they do? That was so, you know, real questions that actually advance the game, because let's face it. Like you said, if there's going to be a million shows about LeBron James on ESPN, there's only re- one reason why, because the customer's watching it. And if the customer is watching it, that's good for growing the game and good for growing the brand. Now, what you need to do is you need to figure a way that you can grow that brand while at the same time respecting their space. And I think finding the right the right athletes who were, you know, initially playing the game to now maybe come and be some of those middlemen. I think that would be probably the best way. And we're starting to see it with a lot more athletes now getting these positions in media. And I think they're some of the ones that are the best doing it. Um, I think one specific person with that is um, Candace Parker on, on TNT. She's such a fantastic analyst and, and she, uh, you know, uh, analyzes the game from both sides of the ball. And another player that does it is like Dwayne Wade. And I feel like sometimes we have to also make sure that we get some of the, the, the fresher players that have just come out to also be in those roles and not just the old heads like Chuck. Oh God! Don't mention Chuck because <laughs> man, the, this man be saying things. I'm just like, yeah, really. All this I time you played the game, all this time you've been doing this. This is the Street best clothes. you got. Street clothes, baby. I agree with a lot of what you just said. I think there should be some sort of like mentorship program 
where that the younger athletes and the older athletes get together and help each other, under, help the younger athletes understand what gets what's required of them, how to best handle it, how to like I guess pace it and stuff like that, help them understand. Cause like like for example, Naomi she said that like she's not good at public speaking. Some of those things like public speaking, getting again aware of being aware of your audience, stuff like that, are kind of skills people develop. Not everyone are able to develop said skills. So it's like people we should also be co- uh, conscious of stuff like that too. So maybe help the athletes develop those kinds of skills. Um, I would be more comfortable, more familiar ways I wish I wish that would appease the athletes in which they can still answer the questions that you want them to answer, but in a context in which that they'll feel comfortable. I think it would be the best way to, for that. That might be like we said, you know, maybe going alive for like half hour and just going and just going through a list of questions that you were handed and just giving answers to those questions, or maybe just giving it about how you feel about the game and how you felt about the play, previous playoff games play. Maybe something like that, that will give them an opportunity to, I guess, be in their own environment while simultaneously still answering the question and still giving access to the fans in which we can still get what we need from them while they don't have to, I guess, overexert themselves mentally or otherwise. Yeah, I can agree with what you guys are saying because to me, the way they are doing it, I just think it's, at this point, it's exhausting. exhausting. As a fan, like, I would be watching the post game and they have something, I'm just like, I look around, I'm like, seriously? You watch 48 minutes of this, of this basketball game, you watch 60 minutes of this football game, and... Of all the things that you know that happened there, this is the question you came up with. It's the best sometimes I'm like, sometimes a lot of time I feel like a lot of these journalists, they don't know much about sports, or at least don't know sports, or at least they never played. No, no, let me not say they don't know about sports. They never played, so they've never been in that position. So all they know is they understand it from a you know journalistic point of view. So they ask the questions as such, which still seems somewhat. Sometimes it seems you know lazy journalism to me, but it's like because they don't they only doing that. The last time the athletes, especially, you know, after a frustrating loss, having to sit there. And it's usually, of course, the top three, two, three guys on the team mm-hmm. that's forced to do that. Mm-hmm. And I was like, if you look at it, you know, the rest of the guys, they're like, okay, you know, I don't have to talk. So it doesn't matter, whatever. But it's just like, so a middle ground is definitely needed. It's just a matter of, like, finding out, you know. And I think if, it, if it's going to be, if somebody's going to get it done, it's going to be this generation of athletes. Because they're vocal. Like we said, they're not, you know, they didn't. They, they, they're not taking anything that you know that you hand them. They're not accepting, you know, whatever. They say, "Oh, you're gonna find me? Fine, I, I could, I could afford it. Whatever. I'm still putting myself first. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. They're putting themselves first as opposed to putting the sports first. As opposed to these guys. Oh man, I have like 17 injuries. I'm gonna play with it. Something's wrong. I'm gonna play with it. These guys are like, nope. I'm injured. I'm sitting. I'm sitting out. And if, like you said, if it's gonna be a generation that's gonna get it done, it's gonna be this one. Okay, so then how about this last question then for you? Mm-hmm. Since, you know, we have all this hy- hyper-sensitive nature, Anthony Davis, you know, who's come under a lot of criticism for his injuries, which, mm-hmm. you know, being injured is one thing, but, you know, having a reputation for it is another, so it becomes a sticky situation of, you know, the guy's hurt, but when you put the injury-prone label on him and you have guys like Snoop Dogg who are coming out, you know, against him, you know, calling the Lakers out and everything like that, and recently... You know, Snoop Dogg, I mean, AD just unfollowed Snoop Dogg. You know, AD doesn't want that smoke. AD's coming back from it. What do you do in situations like that where it's like, you know, Anthony Davis, you're a great player, but you are consistently injured. And at a certain point in time, that is a narrative where fair or unfair people are going to use it. So where do we draw that line as well, where people have to also take, you know, when you're in that line, like criticism, you know, you can't avoid it at a certain point. Okay, but in the case of like that, when you know you say uh, when you're in the limelight, mm-hmm. but at this point, it's a, you know, AD realized that you know Snoop Dogg was saying this, or you know whoever was saying this. That's the beauty of you know of of the time we live in. You mm-hmm. could block that from your from from, from, from your timeline. You could block that person entirely. Mm-hmm. You could never see something they say again, and mm-hmm. somebody else say it again. You could always block them too, or mm-hmm. you could always remove yourself from you know from social media. Like because for example. If Kawhi retired today, we may never see him again. Because mm-hmm. that means that on, he's, on, he's, on, so he's on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, nowhere. He shows up, he does his job, and goes home. That's so it's it. like, there's always that too. So in terms of, you know, like, the narrative usually, if we look at, if we talk about the narrative, it's not coming, it's usually coming from, like, one person said it, and then everybody has to become a mouthpiece for that same person. 
It's usually like it's not it's not it's not because you know a whole lot of people analyze it. That's what they come up with. No, it's usually like you know one person said it, and now because of the viral nature that you know that we live in, everybody wants to be, go viral. So you will see a lot of time you know they will go in these comments and say some ridiculous things, hoping somebody you know notice it and then they get multiple likes and follow and just go from there. So sometimes the narrative is just that. It's just a narrative. You pick and choose what you want to go with. I think I must ask ourselves this. I think in terms of that situation with AD. Snoop Dogg's reaction is purely emotion. There's plenty of mm-hmm. NBA players that are that are injury prone. Mm-hmm. AD's been injury prone since he got to the league. Mm-hmm. We knew this. We accepted it. It wasn't a problem when he won a chip last year. Mm-hmm. It's only a problem now because they're losing. Mm-hmm. So this is a very emotional reaction, which we, we do have because we're fans. Mm-hmm. We like these people. We like these teams. We want to see them win. So we have an emotional reaction. Mm-hmm. But it's also not fair to the fans when a oh, oh, hundred, a thousand, a million of you, you from a million of people are telling AD how he sucks <laughs> because he's hurt. Like, <laughs> he what close. Do you want to do? <laughs> he wants to be hurt? <laughs> he will <laughs> like, yeah, say, and fail my team and not win. Are you kidding me? Come on. This, <laughs> like, Day. It's a madness. That says same thing as we said about CP3 and a whole bunch of other players. It's like it is what it is, bro. Like we, we, it is what it is. Injuries happen. I don't, what do you want? And beats hurt right now. Like, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> what do you want from them? It's just what it is. So it's like, mm-hmm. I don't know. Like I said, Snoop, Snoop Dogg's just being emotional because he's been a Laker fan his whole entire life. <laughs> so then, so, <laughs> so now he's upset because he knows he's not going with an AD. That's it. Mm-hmm. That's all it is to it. And AD knows that. So he's like, I'm not dealing with this. <laughs> <laughs> what more do I have to do? I won last year, bro. You know what like, what yeah. from him? What like, from him? I don't like, know. Last year, what you bought, bought the team the, the first championship in ten years. So it's Come like on, you know, I understand this is a we you know like the, the Lakers has some certain expectations. You know, for example, like with the Lakers, you expect winning from them. You don't expect just a playoff appearance. Like you know. Right. If you're the Knicks, a playoff appearance is okay I for you. I knew that was coming. I knew <laughs> that was coming. <laughs> he had to do it, bro. He had to do it. I was waiting for he it. I even rocked it. back to it just to be hear me. Yeah, I leaned I back because I knew, I knew that shot was if coming. If you're the Knicks, a playoff appearance is a win for you. If you're the Lakers, the first round, um, the first round in loss is 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 failure. A second round loss, if you don't make this the conference finals or the finals of win, everything else is just like no, it's just subpar. So, exactly. you know, so it's like, so, you, you know, we tend to get used to that. So, I mean, you know, it's just a matter of like figuring out the balance. And I hope that, you know, both the players and the media could come to, a, you know, uh, um, a middle ground so that everybody wins because in, in the end, that's, you know, they both benefit from it. So, mm-hmm. all, right. all right. So I thank you guys. Um, and I thank you guys for joining me. And as for you guys, what do you guys think? You know, um, should there be, you know, what would you say is the middle ground? What would you go? How would you go about it? Uh, let me know in the comments. Like, follow. And, yeah. Thank you guys for joining me. Until uh, next time. Peace. Thanks for watching Sports Table Talk. If you enjoyed what you just watched, please check out the other shows on this channel, which include The Bait Boss, Open Table Discussions, Table Advice, and Table of Cinema. And last but not least, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Make sure you like the video, comment below, and share with your friends and family. Thanks for your support.